Got it. Give a second to everybody who's just coming on. I'm so excited about this night tonight and the fact that I have found Kate, who's like my new biggest hero. While we're waiting, um, I just want you to take a minute and you don't have to type it in the chat. You can write it down or type it in your phone, but um, post a couple or post a couple or write down a couple ideas um, you had about what it meant to be a mother or father. So as a couple more people join, what did it mean to be a mother or father? Or just think about it, what it means to be a mother or father. Okay, let's let's reinforce the people or who are here on time. Um, I am so excited to introduce. Uh, well, let, let me first talk about how this is going to go. So we're going to start our event um, talking to Kate Mangino and about her great book that everybody should buy, um, which is really talking about equal partners and improving gender equity at home. And it's a practical guide for readers about gender norm and household ba balance. And uh, part of our gender problem is structural and that requires policy change. But if we've been watching the news, that's not gonna happen very fast. And so how can we change that within our own families and with our own, within our own um, communities? And you know, Park Slope Parents with 7,000 families will help the community support this more this equal parenting that we're hoping hoping to get to. Um, Kate will talk. Kate and I are going to have a question and answer. Then we've got some uh, two couples that feel like they've got a grasp on this idea of equal parenting, and they're going to share their ideas, and they're going to share some of their tips and how they keep keep things going. And then um, and then we'll wrap up with just some. Susan Fox, PhD, here's how to have better conversations. Because when we read through your comments, there were a lot of comments that were, that were about, how do I start this conversation? How do I have this conversation in a non-judgmental way? How do, I, how do I talk to my partner without them feeling shame and, and guilt and defensiveness? So we'll kind of wrap that up with some tips and strategies around that. Um, a little bit more about Kate is that she is a gender expert and she works with international nonprofit organizations to promote positive social change. She writes curricula about gender equality, gender uh, women's empowerment. And I love the idea, healthy masculinity. What does that look like? Um, she deals with HIV prevention and early and forced childhood marriage. Her book is an interactive guide to support building household balance in all partnerships. So before she and I start talking, I wanna kind of give some broad frame, framework for this. And the first one is this is about both partners having a better life. Uh, it's not just mo mothers who gain from equal parenting, but it's fathers having deeper connections with their children and their partners. So I wanna see this not as a women, women win and men lose. This is that both partners, um, both partners win. Uh, and as this, our discussion is, you know, we've all seen the headlines about how, how bad moms have it. So what I love about, you know, how Kate frames this book is like, we know it's bad, what are we gonna do about it? Where do we go from here? So that's what this discussion is about. It's not about, uh, you know, whining and being angry you know there's a lot of books about the rage of motherhood and so we're going to get past that so i'm really excited about that you know the next thing is that we'll talk about gender roles but those aren't aren't just present in male female relationships and and heterosexual couples so this event and her book is focused on 
straight, gay, trans, and non-binary parents and grandparents and friends and all of the people who you can have relationships with. So, and we've only got an hour and 15 minutes. And so we're all going to be left wanting. And if this goes well, we, I am excited to have more kinds of conversations like this that help us, you know, think of this as an appetizer. And if it's helpful, we'll work on giving you the whole smorgasbord. Um, and, and one last thing is equal par partners and uh, in our case, equal parenting is about having a partner that's open to working uh, on having a better life for your family. So if you are in a situation with either domestic violence or the threat of violence um, or domestic abuse of any kind, tread lightly. It might be a, a time that where you decide that you need to seek other resources and therapy first because you don't you don't you don't want to go down a road that that uh, it will make things worse. Okay, Kate, we're ready for you. How are you doing today? Oh, now you got you're muted again. You, there we go. Okay, I'm. Uh, I got permission to speak. I am well. Thank <laughs> you. you. Thank you for having me today. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm excited about your book. I think it hits all the right buttons and. You know, we do say that gender, the gender problem is both structural and social. So what do you mean by that when you, when you say that? Um, so we know that real social change happens when, when we have both two things happening at once, right? You have like a policy structure that is kind of setting a top-down law policy structure, and then you have this grassroots bottom-up. And this kind of has to happen for long-term social change. You know, I, I give the example of like, you know, back in the eighties when we all learned how to recycle, you both needed like a law and a structure and curbside pickup. And then you needed people to start actually separating their, their trash and, and doing it. So you need both things at once. Um, so we have a lot of structural, um, you know, components in our, in our jobs, in our lives, in our schools, in the way that our communities are structured that, that perpetuates misogyny and perpetuates inequality of gender roles. And that needs to change. For example, you know, paid care for all would be a great change. Um, affordable childcare would be a great structural change. Uh, but until we get to those pieces, we can also do things in a social movement that you, you know, it kind of gives me solace that while we're waiting for the big structural changes to happen, in the meantime, we can do something. We don't have to just sit and wait for government to do something. We have the power to start conversations in our own families, in our own households. And my work has always been on the social side. So that's where my comfort level is. Um, I, I just meet with groups of people, um, whether it's a clinic or, a community or a school group, and we we talk. We talk about social barriers and social norms and what goals everyone's trying to get towards and work through that. So my book is sort of acknowledging structural barriers, but focusing on what we can do personally. Yeah, and, and I love that about it because it's not just, again, this everything is wrong. We have to change it from the top, you know, the top. We until then, what can we be doing? Um, so your book is about equal partners, but Parksville Parents is about parents and uh, families. And so when you think about how, you know, how the structural and social um, problems are, well, let me just ask, how do you think that, that this, these structural and social issues impact parents? especially when they're start kind of starting out their new parenting journey. I mean, hugely. I mean, I could have written the whole book for parents, but I was trying to be more inclusive. I think that, and actually one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book is because a lot of the material to date has really been for, you know, different sex couples with kids under the age of 18, right? It was, it was in this very like sort of niche conversation and gender inequality happens in all kinds of couples, whether or not you have kids or not. So I was trying to sort of take a step back and be more inclusive. Um, however, I think that it's pretty you know, obvious and we have data to support it that 
gender inequality and, and household imbalance becomes more of an issue when there are kids in the home. When there aren't children, and if you don't have long-term caregiving responsibilities, one person can do more and still have leisure time and still get enough sleep and still be able to fulfill professional goals because there's just less to do in a house without kids. I'm a parent. My kids just turned April's birthday month for us. They were born three years and one week apart. So they just turned nine and 12. So they're old enough that I'm beyond naps and diapers, but young enough that I remember naps and diapers. Um, mm -hmm. And we just, all of us parents know that parenting, it just, it changes what needs to be done in a household exponentially. And that there are so many gender norms attached to being a mother, being a father, so many assumptions about women and caregiving, natural instinct, maternal instinct, mom knows best. There's a lot of these underlying norms that still exist in our culture, even though they're not necessarily spoken out loud and they feel they feel archaic when you say them out loud, but there, there are these underlying assumptions that I think a lot of people still fall back on. So I do think that you see a much steeper uh, imbalance of, of household when you have kids, you know, whether that's one baby or five babies, it's a lot of work. Yeah, we had, we, we have this back to work 411 um, event mm -hmm. and this, and this mother said, my partner can do absolutely everything except breastfeed. Mm -hmm. Every single action in the house related to parenting outside the house, they can do everything but breastfeed. And then if you take the bottle and put breast milk in the bottle, then, you know, so this idea that women are supposed to do one thing and men are supposed to do, you know, that, that you have right. these roles. So right. I, I think that, you know, that ends up being, um, I'm going to jump a question because I think it's relevant here. Sure. You know, um, in my experience, and, and I would love to know by show of head nods from Talia and, and Philip and Alexandra, uh, who are on video, you know, most parents, especially dads, uh, are outdoing the amount of work that their parents put in. You know, we talked oh, about yeah. this before we got on. Yeah. They're doing more caregiving. They're doing more quality time. So um, we see that over and over that mothers in two parent in, in the mom and dad households are overwhelmed. So how can parents unlearn those roles that they've grown up with and become more equal and dare I say happier? <laughs> First of all, I think that you're right. We have come so far since, you know, our the role models of our fathers and grandfathers. And so I think a lot of people think we're here. Like this is as good as it gets. Look how far we've come. We're done. And I think it's really important to intentionally say to ourselves, okay, yes, we have come so far and that's amazing. And we still have a lot further to go. We haven't reached the end. We're not uh, you know, this is not as good as it gets that we have further to go. Um, we're at a milestone, right? Not an ending point. I think that's really important um, to just keep repeating out loud. And I do think that parenting norms have changed. Parenting expectations have changed. Before we let everyone in, we were talking about the statistic that uh, that stay-at-home moms in 1973 spent fewer hours a week with their kids than full-time working moms do in 2023. Right. So in 50 years, we just expect parents to do so much more. You know, I was born in 76. I grew up in the in the 80s. I came home from school every day and watched five hours of TV and no one thought that was a problem. But nowadays, if your kids did that, you would be berated as being a horrible parent for putting your kid in front of the TV for five hours. So I think we have to acknowledge how much parenting expectations have changed as well. And I think that all goes in with sort of you know, how much shame we might feel about parenting choices that we make. And I think gender is in the same, you know, I love Brene Brown for these conversations, oh, yeah. but to really lean into saying, you know, I'm going to make the best decisions for my family. My partner and I are going to make decisions for our family. We think this is best for our family. And we're not going to accept any shame that other people try to assign us because of our decisions, that we're confident in these decisions. Easier said than done. I understand. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I want to ask you about what the EP40 is, because for people that are coming to your book brand new, this is these, these are exciting people. So I think there's a lot of information in media right now about what men do wrong, right? Um, the Harvey Weinstein stories. And those are important and we need to call those out and we need, there needs to be accountability for, for bad behavior. But I think it um, is sad and draining and it's not what I wanted to spend my life researching. And I have a son who just turned nine and I don't want him to just grow up looking at what toxic masculinity is. I want him to, you know, not feel bad for being male. I want him to have all kinds of representations of healthy masculinity. And I want him to grow up knowing that however he wants to be a boy is okay. Um, and so to find that, you know, I just, I do a lot of appreciative work in my, in my, you know, paid day job, so to speak with, with international organizations. Um, I use appreciative inquiry as a methodology. And so I decided to look at positive deviance and say, okay, this might not be representative of the norm right now, but I want to meet equal partners. I want to talk to men who are already doing it. And I want to find out what got them there. Like what, what's their motivation? Sorry about that. Um, I forgot to unplug the phone. Um, what's their motivation? Uh, how do they do it? Like how, just day to day, how do they make it work? Um, and advice they might have for raising um, boys so that we can raise another generation of equal partners. So I it took me about a year and a half to find 40 of these men who fit my rubric of what an equal partner is, which seems sad when I say a year and a half and I only found 40. But the reason why, I think, yes, there aren't enough of them out there. But my biggest um, hypothesis and why it took me so long is because there's no listserv to find equal partners. I kind of had to go community to community and just talk to different people and say, hey, is this you? Is this you? Do you know, do you know someone like this? There was no Twitter feed <laughs> available or Facebook group. And so it, I was defining something while I was finding something. And I was also quite determined to find a diverse group of people. I didn't want everyone to be in the New York metropolitan area with a master's degree, right? So I, I have, um, I looked, I found e the EP40 come from all over the US and Canada from, a, I have, um, I oversampled men of color because they're under um, sampled generally speaking. So, uh, so it took me a year and a half to find a, a group of men that I really thought collectively gave us information and the answers that I was looking for. And I just nicknamed them the EP40 because spelling out 40 equal partners was long. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you talk about these EP 40 and, you know, I remember a friend of mine who was like, uh, he was male, he was a dad. And he said, uh, he said, well, I pick up the kids half the time. And this was, this was his idea of I'm doing so much. And so can you talk about the difference between this, what is an equal partner but, versus what is a hands-on partner? Yeah, I think that this is a really important designation. So um, a hand, I call either a hands-on or helper. Some people think of the helper. It's, so if you have one person in your household who's like a manager who keeps their eye on everything that goes on and then says like, hey, can you unload the dishwasher? Can you pick up the pizza for the birthday party? Can you take them to soccer? Oh, there's a field trip in two weeks. Can you take off work? Let me send you an invite to your calendar so you can take off work. That is that's not equal partnership. That's a manager and an employee situation. And there's a lot of that out there. That's kind of our norm. Uh, academics call it um, neo-traditional relationships where both of you earn income, you're both participating in the economy, but one of you is taking on far more labor in the household than the other. And it uh, more often than not, it's the female who's taking on more. But I've met plenty of couples that are switched and plenty of same-sex and queer couples that take on these personality traits as well or, or roles. So I don't want to always assume it's, um, you know, man-woman situation. Um, anyway, so an equal partnership is really when both of you um, take on physical work, both of you take on cognitive work, um, both of you take on routine tasks. So the things that have to happen every single day, like picking kids up from school, cooking dinner, doing dishes, um, uh, bath time, homework time, right? And both of you take on intermittent tasks, mowing the lawn, 
fix it projects, finances, you know, things that don't have to happen every single day. Um, to a lot of traditional families, you know, the guys do the outside and the women do the inside. And that is one way to delegate tasks, but it's nowhere near 50-50. It probably falls more like a 25-75. So I think if you really want equal partnership, you need to split physical and cognitive tasks and you need to split intermittent and routine tasks. And you have to be very conscious about it because it doesn't happen naturally. I mean, I study this for a living. It doesn't happen naturally in my household either. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's one of the, spoiler alert, this takes a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wish there was an easy, like, some kind of magic bullet, but there isn't. It, this just yeah. takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. And, you know, before we got on, we were talking about Nancy McDermott's book, The Problem with Parenting. And that book started from this, you might be a helicopter parent. Why? Because society has, has since fetal alcohol syndrome has, has told you every single decision you make about your child will lead to their success and happiness. So, I, I left reading that book going, okay, it's not my fault. So I think that when, when I think about this EP40 and about parents who are struggling to become an equal parent, if you start with this kind of, this has been socialized in us from day one, the yeah. media pushes it. You know, even the diaper commercials with dad make fun of the dad. So if you see this as a, of course, there's an issue here. So let's put that issue outside of us and look at how to change it from the inside, knowing that the issues are this, this, let's not blame, let's not blame the moms, let's not blame the dads, let's blame the pressure and the society. And that kind of takes off, some, hopefully, some of the pressure that I have in talking to my partner and my partner have in, in receiving my message. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think we have that, you know, I, I say that a lot. We have to get away from blaming individuals and blame the social structure that we've all been raised into because we've all been raised into this. You know, we've, we socialize boys to be a certain way. We socialize girls to be a certain way. And I think we need to recognize that. And, you know, I had someone write me um, early on when my book first came out last summer. And she said, the EP40 make me feel bad about myself. Like it makes me feel bad about my partner. Like I picked a bad guy and now I'm just sad that I'm not married to one of these guys. And I was like, well, that was not my intention. I'm sorry <laughs> that you felt that way after you read it. Um, you know, I think if anything, I want to normalize the conversations about the men who step up, who don't take the work promotion and maybe earn less money so they can be more present in the home. The men who, you know, um, are comfortable taking on, you know, being that sort of alpha parent in the house or being that 50-50 parent. We don't hear enough of that. You're right. We have, there's too many buffoon dad jokes, right, in movies and um, and sitcoms. It drives my husband insane. You know, he's just like, why you know, or like the onesies that they're like the onesie for dad. And it has arrows, arm, arm, leg, leg. Like we, our culture loves to make fun of the stupidity of fathers. This is not helping. <laughs> fathers aren't stupid. It's condescending. Um, it's patronizing, ironically. And I think that we need to, instead of those narratives, which might get a joke, you know, at work, I get that, but we need to move towards stories and narratives that normalize a different kind of partnership and a different kind of dad. Um, so that's what I was going for. I, I also am really clear that I am, I don't, I don't have any sort of like, this is the gold standard. This is what we all need to be. You know, I sort of give these guys as like an example. This is how they make it work. This is where they came from. You know, it's interesting stories. But that might not work for you, right? Like every, like life is hard. Raising kids is hard. Staying happily married is really hard. Whatever works for you is great. If you're looking for alternative ideas or stories or examples, fantastic. Let's have that conversation. Um, it's about a continuum, right? And every couple has to kind of move up or move down the line to find a fit that works for them where they're happy. But there's, I don't have in my mind a right or a wrong. Um, I certainly don't have any, you know, all the answers in my relationship. We 
can, we continue to struggle through this just like everyone else. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because they talk about the work-life balance, you know, and working moms need a work-life balance. And, and somebody used the term, it's a work-life juggle. Sometimes you've got to focus more on work. Sometimes you have to focus more on family. And there might be some time, some time when you have, um, you know, it's not an equal partnership because, you know, of X, Y, Z, and then it'll, it'll balance out one way or the other. Um, so I want to talk about any advice you would give to expectant parents, first oh. expectants, then we're going to, so we've got expectant parents about creating partnerships, and then older parents who've already gotten into the pattern. But let's start with expectant parents. I'm expecting this baby. It's going to be great. I'm going to be a great mom. I'm going to be a great dad. How do we get there as an equal part, uh, parent? So I think the one thing to, uh, and I have a whole section of my book about breastfeeding because I think it is a really important thing to talk about. If you decide to breastfeed and I don't have an opinion about whether you should or shouldn't, I think every way you are a parent is a great way. So I don't have a perspective on that. But if you do have one parent breastfeeding, that does just add an enormous imbalance to the household, right? And so I just think you have to understand that and you have to find ways that your partner can counterbalance that massive time-consuming stressful task that is breastfeeding. So I think that's an important conversation to have, you know, right, right out of the gate. Um, lessons learned from the couples that I've interviewed is that it's really important that both parents you might have your domains, like one of you might be laundry and one of you might be cooking, right? But you both should know how to do everything. And the way to do that is both of you need to spend a lot of time together and a lot of time alone with your new baby. Um, you, you know, when I think it's, it's common for like both of you to take time off and then maybe dad goes back a little bit earlier and then mom eventually goes back. But as much as possible, however you can work it with your finances and your work schedules to find either a block of time where both partners can take turns with parental leave or during the week, you both have days or hours so that you both learn how to do everything, right? You might have your domains, you might have the things that you do typically when you're all together, but if one of, if only one of you knows how to do everything, that's going to start to Cause a shift, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I and think that's, I, go ahead. No, no, sorry. Go ahead. You had a follow up. Um, so, so what happens to the people who started down the, it's going to be great path. And then it was the breastfeeding and it was the, and I, I, I know what I was going to say. A lot of people I have seen have gone the, they both stay home for three weeks. Then the mom stays home for two months. Then the dad I mean, we're so lucky to have, yes. you know, paid family leave in, in New York City that the dad can take that time off. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so um, that's super helpful. And so I've seen that staggered. And then you have to, you have to step up because, you know, one partner's at work and the other partner right. uh, got it the holding the whole kit and caboodle. Right. Um, it's amazing. We do have to, I do want to, you know, um, just say that a lot of men are still facing social pressure not to take their paternity leave. So they might have that um, at their in their office at their work, but then their boss is like, "Hey, by the bot, you know, by the way, wink, wink. If you're really serious about your career, don't stay home for more than a week. Make sure you get back to the office." I think men feel more pressure to to keep working than women do. Um, my husband came home and shared a story just a few weeks ago and said like, Oh, I'm really bummed. Cause this, you know, a, a colleague of mine got this bad advice. And I was like, you know, I just made assumptions. I said, Oh, what a jerk. Was it an, was it an old guy who, you know, didn't. And he was like, no, it was a woman who told him to get back to work. So, I mean, I think that we, we have to be, we have to encourage each other. We have to be encouraging our partners and our colleagues. And if you're in a management position, really try to normalize all new parents taking time off because we still have a ways to go with that. But yes, I think that's amazing is when you can stagger it and you can each have a chunk of time at home to really bond with that baby and um, find your own rhythm with your own child without the other person around. Yeah. Um, so 
I want to ask you one other question and then talk about how we're going to change the future and our and our boys and our girls. But you know, I know that that you've spoken in other contexts about maternal gatekeeping and this idea that yeah. you know my first child was born three days after 11, 9 11 and she's graduating college in five days by the way but anyway so she um it turns out that um it was right after 9 11 so the finance was going crazy and he had to go to work and i i was not working and so i felt like i got to do this thing right and so he would come home tired and so talk about maternal gatekeeping and i don't you know i want to make sure that we don't blame mom because that's important too but how does that impact this whole equal parenting idea yeah i hate talking about maternal gatekeeping and i have to talk about maternal gatekeeping um for this for that reason because i don't want anyone to think i am pointing to moms as like it's your it's your fault there's an, an unequal balance at home because that's not what i'm doing i think it's just it's becoming more and more obvious to me that it is just as hard to step back and create a space for someone else to step up than it is, like it's just as hard to step back as it is to step forward. If you're the person who's been used to doing less in your home, it's awkward to do more. You're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna flounder a little bit. It's going to be an awkward situation. You you might feel inadequate. You might feel a bit silly that you're not better at it. You might make mistakes and make your kids cry and it's going to be a hard process. At the same time, if you're the person who's used to doing more and you have to step back. And I, I just said that to my mother a few weeks ago, my, my brother has cognitive and physical disabilities and my mom and I are co-guardians for his care. And I said, and you know, my mom maternal gatekeeps for my brother. And I'll say, you know, Mom, you have to step back and create the space for me to step up and spend more time with Dan and um, establish, reestablish our relationship with just the two of us without you. You know, that's important. So it's, it's interesting that I'm in this other dynamic um, away from parenting. Uh, and, and, and I think we have to be aware of when maternal gatekeeping is happening. We know where it comes from. It comes from a history of women not having a voice or authority in a professional space or a community space. And the one place that women historically had power and authority and a voice was in the home. And we've inherited that generations later. And it's hard to let that go. And it is often tied to our value, how we value ourselves, how other people's value, how other people value us. When I step back at home, it makes me feel like a bad mom. It makes me feel like a bad wife. I'm not, and I, that's a personal statement. When I, um, when I go on a work trip or when I just need to take some time away for myself because whatever, I need to go to bed early or I just need a few hours and I ask my husband or I allow him to, you know, or not, you know, I create the space for him to step up. It makes me feel like I'm failing. And I think that that is an important feeling to recognize and to talk about in your partnership and to talk about the awkwardness of stepping forward and the awkwardness of stepping back and make sure that we're not perpetuating maternal gatekeeping. I don't just see it from moms. I see it from grandmothers. My own mother-in-law, who thankfully is not on this call, so I can share this story, was terrible (laughs) at maternal gatekeeping. You know, when our first was born, she would like scold my husband and say like, you don't know what you're talking about. Let Kate make the decisions. She's the mom. And I, and she was trying to be kind to me. She was, she did it out of a place of love, but it made my husband feel bad. And it made him, you know, it, it, it started this imbalance, you know? And so we had to verbalize to her, no, no, the truth is neither one of us have any idea what we're doing, (laughs) right? We're both doing the best we can. And so sometimes you have to counter those statements that are coming from older family members, community members, faith community members who are trying to be nice, but being harmful accidentally. Um, would you talk, would you talk about the example that you had of somebody, the, the doctor, the doctor wife and the stay at home dad and what eventually happened when they decided as a couple, because I, I think this is important. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Park Slope parents community, because 
it goes back to that is the community supporting your individual decision. Can you go, can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, of course. One of the EP40 was um, married to a physician and she made plenty of money and um, the kids were little like infant and two or something like that. And he came to the, they came to the conclusion together that he didn't need to work. They didn't need money. They needed time. That's what their family needed. And he was quite happy to be a stay-at-home dad. So he left his job and became a stay at home and she earned enough for the family and everything was going fine. And he said the community didn't rally around him. His guy friends made fun of him. Uh, his mother-in-law was constantly making little digs, you know, at him about how lazy he was and how he wasn't um, there for his family. And he said it was a particularly painful because I think it was his sister-in-law who a couple years ago had stepped away from work to be a stay-at-home mom. And the family totally rallied around her and was saying, you're making a great decision. We're so proud of you. We're here for you. But when he did it, he was lazy. And his mother-in-law would say, oh, you just want more time in your workshop. And um, so he said after about two years, they sort of gave up and he went back to work. And I interviewed him years later and he said he really regretted that, that they made a major life decision for their family that wasn't the best decision for their family because of community pressure and family yeah. pressure. And so I think that's why it's so important that when we see people stepping out of their gender role, when we see women leaning into work, when we see men leaning into the home, be supportive you know, verbalize that, say, it must be hard for you. It must feel weird sometimes, but just know I'm here to support you. If you need to vent, if you need a friend, you know, I think what you're doing is great. And sometimes just hearing little affirmations like that can make all the difference in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the, the maternal gatekeeping and the, uh, yeah, honey, I'd really like you to do X, but only if you do it the way I, I do it. That can be, I know that I, I, I pecked, I henpecked my husband out of that. And um, so um, we want to take a, a few minutes for questions. Um, I also want to jump in to talk to Alexandra and Talia and Phil. So um, if you have any questions, you know what, let's, let's save the questions. Think about them now. And then we'll hear from Alexandra and Talia and Phil. And um, we'll get back to questions because I'm really excited about that. Do you guys have a... I want to go first or anything? Talia. Talia, Talia and Phil, tell your story. I think we have to give them, I'm asking you to unmute. Hi, hi everyone. Um, Are we going to stop doing these things on your laptop? I know, I sure. have such a bad camera now that I'm seeing it big. Well, if you turn on the lights. All right. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah we um we've worked we work really 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 hard at trying to keep things time equal um we think about our live lives as kind of like a series of hours um and so i get i guess i could just jump into kind of what works for us um this is what works for us and i want you know i wonder where if you want to come into like Right now we've got a two, we've got one kid and we are both very lucky to have, you know, relatively flexible work schedules. So I do want to say that. Um, and, and we hope to have more. And, um, and so right now what we do is every hour that we're with the baby is very much accounted for of on Mondays, I wake up with the baby, I'm with the baby six to eight. So I'm doing the bottle and breakfast and then Phil's with the baby eight to 10 and he's doing getting ready for school and going to school. If he chooses to drop off the baby early, no problem. If the baby sleeps later than six by some miracle, no problem. You know, then we like kind of adjust, but those are hours that we're on. And then same thing for after school, either I pick the baby up or he picks the baby up while I'm doing if I'm making dinner, which is rare, you know, usually Phil's making dinner, then I'll hang with the baby while he makes dinner or we'll all make dinner together. And then when we think about bedtime, it's the same thing where if I'm doing bedtime, Phil's cleaning up the house or if Phil's cleaning up or if Phil's doing bedtime, I'm cleaning up the house. So we're like our hours on are really, we really try to keep them very even. Um, and then on the weekends, I, I was in a drum troupe, an all women's samba reggae drum troupe called Batala in New York City for a very long time. And some of my role models used to say, um, 
that they parent like they're divorced. And I kind of got that idea in my head of um, they were able to come with young kids, having young kids, they were able to come to four hour long rehearsals on Sundays because they were off all day on Sunday and their partner was off all day on Saturday and they were on all day. And it was like full custody, whatever their partner was doing with the kid, whatever food they were feeding them, whatever the schedule was, whatever the nap schedule was, was none of their business. And so I really try to like when we're on the playground or I try to really have it be, you know, it's really none of my business. What goes on when Phil's with the baby by themselves, they have their own relationship and, um, and on weekends, we try to just do. Usually it's like yeah. you're gone Sunday morning and I'm gone like Saturday after. It's not usually the case that like, I don't see you all totally, Saturday and you totally. don't see me all Sunday. Yeah. For me, the whole thing philosophically came out of, it's funny because until you mentioned this just now, I'd forgotten that like you had went to Bathala and the lady said the thing about yeah. parenting like you're divorced. Yeah. But philosophically, it kind of came out of this idea partially like selfishness where it's like we want to be so meticulous about all the hours that are accounted for because we both want to be able to do like we have this sort of saying in our household that everyone gets to do whatever they want whenever they want to so she's like next Thursday I'm going to this thing I'm like great then we're gonna have to figure it out or if you're like next Saturday I want to go do this thing you're like great then we're gonna figure it out and we're gonna like sort of counterbalance the hours before that and after that to make everything feel really good and I think we've been pretty good in the last two years about no one has not been able to do a thing that they wanted to do yeah yeah and so like Phil's in a band like I try to get to yoga or like I just like to like go to a cafe and write in a journal you know for some hours so like we'll often on a Saturday morning we'll be like all right I want three hours today you know or like okay I can I get two hours tomorrow and then we'll just kind of like make sure that we, that literally the number of hours are accounted for. And that's, that's kind of how we do things that I feel that feels really good. And, and I think that as far as the mental load and the, you know, the cognitive load versus like the actually getting stuff done, like the way that we split things up, which may not work for everybody, but I'm really in charge of, I study child development and I work with kids and families. So it's like, it's like very much in my wheelhouse to have opinions on everything with regard to how we're raising our baby. And so, um, and so I'm very much in charge of, you know, thinking like, okay, I want, I do actually want to get an early intervention evaluation or, you know, we're talking to her like this. And I think we should ask more of these kinds of questions, or we're going to give away this toy and not have this toy be in our house. And like, that's kind of my domain, but because that's my domain. And I think this really came up with breastfeeding where I was breastfeeding for eight hours a day. So you know, there's no way to make that up. So Phil did everything else that wasn't breastfeeding. So he washed the bottle parts, washed the pump part. I never, ever, ever washed a pump part. (laughs) (laughs) I like, I hardly ever washed the pump part. And, um, and, and so I think that it came up where like Phil has the full cognitive load for like laundry, dinner, groceries, um, whether or not we're out of diapers anytime soon, like wipes all of the stuff and the gathering and the doing inside of the house is very much Phil's domain where I don't have any, I'm not like, oh, we have to do laundry tomorrow. Can you go do laundry? Like, I don't, I don't know when it's time to do laundry. And at the same time, Phil doesn't really know like what shoe size the baby is. I know that. So, so that's kind of what's worked for us in terms of dividing the cognitive load alongside the actual doing. So that all sounds really, really, really great. When does it not work? Yeah. When does it not work? I feel like there are times where like, like I'm on all of the chats, like the, you know, like the park slope parent and the chats. And I think that there is a lot of like gatekeeping there. Like a lot of the chats are like, Hey moms, or like, there's like one dad in my like baby group chat who's like, you know, active and like, it's nice, but it's, it's like really not Phil's thing to be like involved in the chats. And so then because of that, but it wouldn't, it's like almost like, it's also like personality wise, in addition to gender wise. And, um, and because of that, like, I know like, oh, a lot of people are thinking about potty training, you know, like maybe this is something that we should start thinking about. Like, those are things that sort of come up or like, if you're, yeah. yeah, I think very often it feels like you are informing me what it is now time to start thinking about with the baby because you're already thinking about it or you're plugged in with these message boards or these groups or these signal chats or whatever. 
So yeah. it's not that it's gatekeeping, but it's just like because of the exposure that you have to these sort of parts that we've sort of intentionally compartmentalized, like it sort of has this effect of you like telling me what part of the child development process we are up to. So it can feel a little bit like, okay, like just tell me what to do, I guess, because you've already researched it. So I guess, you know, and just let me know how to execute your vision, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that, I don't think either one of us like loves hundred percent. Right. That works. That works until a point. And then sometimes it's like, all right, well, I want you to have an opinion too, you know? And then I think it, it might, I wonder if you feel that way about like all of these errands that you're running. On no, the, on I'm the not side. The I know you always say that. Okay. Well, yeah, I would, I, and I would love Kate to have, after we hear from Alexander, I'd love Kate's feedback on this idea of, you know, I, in, in preparing for this, I watched a lot of Instagram videos about equal parenting and things like that. And it was like, I'll do what you want. Just tell me what to do. And so exactly. Kate's going, no, that's not, that's not it. And how, and how, I mean, New York city is full of people who are go-getters and, you know, type A, if we use that 90 term type A people. And how do you break out of that when you become a mom or a dad, but a mom, especially with all the roles that are still around it. So I'd, I'd just like you to percolate that for a second. Um, Alexandra, I know your partner is not in, uh, he's at uh, a board meeting, but um, you will have to speak uh, for the, for the, for both of you. So I'm not hearing you. Which is what happened to me at the beginning. Not hearing you. Sean needs to unmute her. Oh, she's unmuted. Again. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Kate while we figure out that issue. Um so sure. how do you how do you get beyond the uh you know and maybe maybe um you have some ideas about the fair play cards? I mean, do you, have you found people have said this worked for me? Did did that work for you, Talia? Hang on, I'm unmuting you again. Yeah, I, I won't remute ourselves, sorry. Um, yes, the fair play cards were actually really great. I was feeling really like similar to what Kate was saying, like guilty about like, I was just like, wow, like Phil does all the, like anytime I mention what Phil does, everyone's like, wow, you know? So I was like, wow, what do I even do? Like he does the laundry, he does the dishes, he does, he, like he's, you know, like basically the house runs because of like him looking at everything that needs to run. Um, and then when we did the fair play cards, it was really awesome because my deck was bigger than Phil's. And we were both surprised by that um, of like what I actually take on right now. But I take on more of the like once in a while stuff of like the thank you notes or the, you know, party planning or the gathering, the family. And we were able to from that place of like, OK, it looks like I do more things that are less frequent. And Phil had almost all of the cards that had that little coffee cup logo of like, you have to do this thing every day, you know, like he had almost all of the everyday cards. But I had a lot more. So our piles looked like this. But then we were like, okay, well, does this actually work for us that you're doing more of the everyday, but I'm doing more of like the running the stuff? And we traded a few cards of like, I actually don't want to plan the next brunch with your brother. Like, could you just call your brother to figure it out? And um, and like the same thing. Phil was like, I do not want to do this healthcare form anymore. Like, could you do the healthcare form? We like traded some cards and it felt really good knowing. I think for both of us that like, I'm not doing nothing, you know, and that Phil's not doing everything and, you know, and that we were able to very much physically see it, which was really impactful, even for us who like really are very serious about things feeling equal and good. Yeah. Comments, Kate. I think we hopped, they had Alexander hop off and come back and there she is again, but go ahead while we're getting her set up. I was just going to say, I'm glad it worked for you. I think it's interesting. Oh, can we hear you now? Do you want to go ahead? Can you hear me? I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, no, you go okay. ahead. You should go ahead. I can, I'll listening. save mine for later. No, 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 finish. <laughs> um, I, what I've learned from other couples is how important it is to just anticipate that every time a milestone happens, your kid changes daycare, goes to preschool, you have another baby, you move, even if it's two blocks away, you get a pet, you change jobs, everything starts over again. So, um, 
And that feels exhausting when you're like, we just got here, but everyone, you know, all of us parents know that those stages are really short. And just when you think you figured out your kid, they change into a different kid. I, although I have to say the older they get, it lasts a little bit longer in between, which is lovely. And so just to anticipate that need, okay, you have a new work schedule. Okay. There's a new baby, or even just, I'm pregnant now. I, I don't have the bandwidth that I used to let's go back to the cards. If those cards worked for you or whatever mechanism worked for you, let's talk about this again and let's see if it makes sense to reallocate or are there new jobs that are taking up more time or it doesn't make sense for you to do this anymore because your commute's different. Um, I just think anticipating the, the need to have this ongoing conversation whenever there's a change in your household routine is really important. And I'll stop and let Alexandra go. Highly relevant to my, my bumps that I'll share. Um, <laughs> so hi, I'm Alex. Um, my partner, Will, had a, a board meeting for his job, so he couldn't attend. But we did an interview last night with some pre-questions. So what I'm about to say represents both of our uh, response. Um, but he had quite a lengthy response. So I'm going to combine them and tell you some of the things where he's like specifically speaking to dads from a dad. But um, so I guess in general, just describing our relationship, he actually really wanted to make a point that we have worked. He basically said, I don't think you can take parenting and isolation of your relationship in general and how you treat your relationship. And um he was like, tell everyone we've been to couples therapy. <laughs> so we have. So um, the first year of our marriage, we moved across the country. We changed jobs. It was like insane. And we almost fell apart. And the main reason we discovered through couples therapy was we didn't take care of ourselves. And um, that kind of insight and ability to understand early on in our marriage that, and before we had kids, um, that taking care of yourself first is like a real thing that keeps your marriage going and that your partner taking care of themselves first might look different than you and that you supporting that is also keeping your marriage going and later on your parenting, co-parenting going. Um, for us has been kind of a bedrock of our understanding of how we want to approach things. Um, and we, my husband's a rugby guy. He's like a big team guy. And so we've always talked about, and I'm I don't know, like one of those cheesy team leadership people at work, I guess. <laughs> and so we've always talked about our relationship as like the ultimate team. Everything we're doing is we're a team together. We're like approaching this together. Um, and I think in that really until parenting, we didn't have a lot of, we didn't have to have a lot of conversations about equality because it was, it's, it's less gendered, um, at least in our life. Uh, but when we became parents, um, oh, I should say we have two children. Uh, we have a three and three quarters year old, as she will tell you, uh, and then another daughter who's one and a half. Um, and, you know, I think I'm trying to think of where to begin or how to make this flow. I think for us, Oh, the other thing he wanted to say, and he really felt strongly about this was he was like, listen, I wish I could say like, I'm just a super feminist and that's why I want, and I'm, you know, dad of girls. And like, that's why I want women to be equal in our parenting. Be equal. He's like, but that's not actually true. I mean, that is true, but like my actual driving for force is selfish. I want to think about the role that I'm going to have in my kid's life and what I get out of being a parent. And I don't want that to be the same thing as my dad who wasn't around you know like he grew up very much hilariously we were having this conversation while he was ironing our clothes and I was taking notes and that so was, this is this is kind of hilarious um but like he grew up in a household where his mom did all of all of the everything and his dad worked and was emotionally unavailable and still kind of is even though he's a lovely older man and um you know that that was his example so he said I guess like my wife is my example I guess what I want out of my relationship is is what drives me with my kids. Um, and to get that, I have to do the same amount of care and be as comfortable and knowledgeable as the mom. And he was like, it's just like, it's that simple. I don't, it's so, um, I guess for us with our first daughter, um, we, well, we also had a weird start. So we, I did breastfeed exclusively and I agree with everything that's been said about breastfeeding. I never touched a pump part. I never washed and like every everything else had to be done by him while I breastfed. And he was very supportive of that. Um, but also 
our first daughter was born at 32 weeks. So she spent six weeks in the NICU. And we always kind of say in a weird way that maybe got us off to a great start of equal parenting, because although I was pumping and we, we did have different circumstances, in a way I was so, we couldn't kind of go right into the like, go home and the mom feels like they know everything. And that like, we were both in this sort of uncharted territory and neither of us really knew anything. Um, so we were learning together. And one thing that we have kept up and we do this kind of at every stage is when there's something new to learn, it's potty training or sleep training, whatever the latest thing is. If there is a course, we will both buy it and watch it if we can together often like asynchronously and we talk about it later. Um, or if there's a book, we will both read it or at least he'll read a summary and I'll read, you know, we'll, we'll try to read the same parts so we can understand so that we, I guess there's just a general acknowledgement that like, we are starting from the same place. And we talk a lot about the fact that like, yes, I'm a woman and I am from a large family full of mothers, lots of aunts, lots of cousins. I have heard, I was a babysitter. Like I have a lot of experience with children. I have culturally been given more of a ground, like a place to start from than he has. Um, but you know, every kid's different and every family's different. And we nobody's, I'm not an expert on what we're supposed to be doing and making it up together. So that's kind of our ethos. Um, those are like the big things I think for us, I, we do, we do also have a mechanism that we made up like early on in dating days after we got in a big fight, <laughs> task responsibility, um, which is we're both Excel freaks. So it's like an Excel grid where we both, we both take a day when we're feeling, when one is feeling overwhelmed, we list everything out that we like can think of that we're doing. It's kind of like an early version of the fair play cards. We do cadence, like how often am I doing this? How much do I have to think about it? Um, and then we go in and assign and color code. And I do think having a mechanism and Kate, to your point about like transitions, <laughs> I know we're weird, um, but having a mechanism and having like a way to talk about it and then also having an understanding that it's gonna change all the time, it does kind of shift the blame because we have traded off being the one who's overwhelmed and gone, hey, I, I need to do the grid. We need to do the grid. And the other one's always like, okay, well, I was feeling fine, but I guess we're going to do that next Friday night. Like we're going to sit down. So I, it takes some of, not the emotion out of it, but it, it just, it's like something you have to get done rather than leading to a, like, I feel like you're not listening, whatever. I'm not going to say we haven't been there. We've totally been there. We've totally fought about hustle tasks and parenting tasks, but you know, that's it. Um, Bumps in the road for us. Um, when you, I'm just going to pre-answer this question, Susan, that you you asked to Tilly and Phil. Um, I would say having the second kid, like we were so brilliant at one kid. We were really proud of ourselves. We were rocking the equal parenting. Then, um, and then I had a high risk pregnancy for my second pregnancy and he just like became the primary parent for our toddler and it was beautiful. And like, I didn't, I kept forgetting to pack snacks and he was all over it. Like, you know, we, it was great. And then I had the second baby who I exclusively breastfed. Uh, and there was like another child to take care of <laughs> and it got a little iffy. Um, and he actually, we were talking about it last night and he was like, you know, I'll actually admit that I didn't, I just thought it was actually easier to take care of our toddler and it was hard and I didn't raise my hand soon enough because I was kind of getting away with it. And he was like, and then the thing that made me do it was I didn't feel like I had a relationship with our baby because I wasn't doing the care tasks and that made me mad. So I jumped back in and started doing it like mad at myself. Um, so, you know, we certainly had some moments there where we were like, I was overwhelmed and he was underwhelmed about his relationship and there was stress, but we talked it through and then figured out our grid. Uh, and then also recently have been through a career shift. I quit my like corporate job last July to pursue consulting and like impact driven work and honestly be on like a big career journey about what I'm trying to do with the rest of my career. Um, and as part of that, I had initially said like, I wanna spend more time with the girls. And that turned into me accidentally becoming a housewife, which I am very unwilling on and also quite bad at, to be honest. It's just not my strong suit. He's much better at household, like cleaning. Yeah. Um, so, but then again, you know, we sat down, came back to our grid. We did try to do the fair play cards that time. To be honest, 
we are going to go revisit our grid soon because we realized what, what we at least didn't work into the process of the fair play cards that's in our grid is not doing things like if somebody just hates doing something, even if it's part of a larger, I'll give you an example. We have cats, unfortunately, um, that we got before we had kids. I love our cats, but it's a lot more care tasks, right? Um, and when we did the fair play cards, there's the whole point about like, you have to own the whole thing. But he hates cutting the cat's nails in a way that like, I just don't really, it doesn't bother me that much. So we've adjusted that, right? So I think that's the one thing for us, like the fair play cards are great. We had a similar experience with the decks that uh, Talia and Phil said, but it, it, like we didn't, that ownership of the whole task is good in theory, but for our household, it makes pe- makes us bitter because we're used to being able to be like, I hate this more than you. And somebody goes, yeah, okay, that's fair. So um, yeah, I think that's it. Sorry, long-winded. Oh, you're muted, Susan. Excellent. Um, I was muted and there was a lot of background noise. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think what I'm hearing from both of you is, you know, uh, my mother, one of my favorite, my mother's favorite lines is this too shall pass. And, and one of mine is, you know, every, every stage in parenting is a phase. So, oh, they're sleeping through the night. Guess what? That's a phase. Oh, they're not sleeping through the night. That's a phase too. So if we think about all of these milestones and all of these changes, you know, Kate, is is there a list in your book of here's all the milestones yet? <laughs> no, I'm going to leave that to a parenting specialist. I don't have a list of milestones, but I agree with you. I think it all, it's all temporary. And so I think that you can, there's solace in that. If it's not working now, we'll get another chance. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, when we read through, when we read through the things that, you know, real realistic, um, concrete stat strategies to make things more equal, practical tips, skills for sharing the load at home. And, you know, one of the realities of all of this is that it's negotiated. All the relationships are negotiated. And while the fair play cards might work for Talia and Phil, you know, the spreadsheet works for Alexandra. And so, you know, I, w- I was talking to Kate before, before we got on and one of the biggest parts, and this goes back to Alexandra and, and therapy, is how do you stay connected so that your partner knows more about what you're feeling instead of, you know, um, there's a uh, Gallagher, the comedian, he's like, oh, how do I know my, my wife is mad at me? You know, I say, are you okay? And she says, just fine. And all the pots, pots in the, the kitchen are rattling around. And it's like, we need to have these open conversations and we need to be connected. And, and John Gottman is what, you know, I teach a, a class at NYU on interpersonal communication in a digital world. So I'll, I'll come back around to that. But, um, but the idea that you need to stay connected and it's so easy, especially if you're home on, on maternity leave, um, your partner's gone to work, how do you, how do you, you know, and I felt like, oh my, oh my gosh, my husband had such a hard day. I don't want to impose on him, you know? And so there were these, these protective things that I was doing as a, a mother to my, my husband and a mother to uh, my child that I was gatekeeping because I was trying to protect him. So in the same way, there's kind of this idea of, of benevolent discrimination, which is a great word. That if you are at work and your your boss says, you know, I'm not going to give that project to so and so because she's just come back from work. So they're doing it to be nice, but it's but so I think in a lot of ways we do benevolent parenting. We try to make it easy. And in doing that, we rob our partners if we're if we're in a heterosexual re- relationship. We're robbing our partners of that connection that they will have. Oh, the baby's crying and you can't calm them. Well, I stay home, so I'll take care of them. So how we do those things. Um, so so in, in summary, and then I want to open it up to any questions, but like pick your moment. 
have have you know have date nights and date nights can include a half an hour of discussing this is how our relationship is going this is how the parenting is going because a lot of you were saying how do we make this so it's not me nagging it's not me angry it's not me shaming and again what kate talked about at the very beginning this overall idea of this this model that we grew up with has been kind of thrust on us. It's been thrust on us from the media, from our parents, from our grandparents. And so breaking out of it, I, I think about a little dinosaur egg and that's all the shell is what we're, we're facing and we need to break out of that. And that takes energy. Um, so instead of, you know, making specific time to have these conversations, um, I am a huge, huge, huge believer in active listening. And that, you know, that includes paraphrasing. That includes reflecting back on what the other person says. I'm sure Alexandra's nodding her head. You probably learned this in, in couples therapy. How do you not say, but I didn't do that, but I only did that. Kate, you're raising your hand. I was just the, I agree with everything you've said. And before you go to questions, there's one thing I wanted to circle back on that Alexandra talked about. You said that your husband's motivation was selfish. And that's what I found from all 40 people that I interviewed as well. That's not just him. That's important. That's fantastic. I think that that uh, when you are doing it for yourself, for selfish reasons, you're much more likely to stick with it than if you're just doing it to be nice to someone else. And the EP40 that I interviewed when I would say like, you know, oh, you're, you're motivated because you're, you're better, you're happier. Mm -hmm. And they would, when I would say, could you give me examples, the things I was jotting down when you were talking, you mentioned relationship with kids. That was always number one. I have a real relationship with my kids. It's not superficial. I don't just show up for a soccer game once a week. I'm I am truly an involved parent. And when that kid grows up to be a huge success, I'm going to feel proud of myself because that's going to be part of me. It's not just going to be because I brought home a paycheck. It's going to be because of the time I put into it. Um, other things that were that came up a lot is the men told me that that I interviewed said that they didn't have to perform masculinity at home and that there are many spaces where men feel like they are forced to perform masculinity. It could be on the rugby field. It could be at work. It could be with your neighbors. It could be with your family, but in home, when it's just me and my partner and the kids, I can be myself. I can be scared. I can be unsure. I can be nervous. I don't have to be strong and in charge and funny and independent. I can just be myself. And that that was a huge relief to the EP40. And they said that was also worth it, that they felt like when they were a full partner and a full parent, they could also be vulnerable and that their partner loved them when they were vulnerable, despite the vulnerability. So I thought that was really interesting. And when you mentioned that, you're like, you know, he feels kind of bad that it's selfish. No, no, he shouldn't feel bad. I thought that that well, was. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's really cool. And you, you know, you mentioned Kate earlier about Brene Brown and she does so much just amazing work about you know being bold in yourself and saying it's I gotta be vulnerable I it, you know daring greatly I mean how can I how can I have this relationship with my partner where we really feel truly connected and that we're raising our kids and and you know this is, a, I'm just going to throw this out here. And I, and clearly you didn't, you didn't run into these, these in your EP 40, but this competitive parenting, I'm going to parent better than my partner. And this idea that I'm going to do it better. You need to kind of step back and say, well, is that part of it? Or, you know, my, my brother got divorced from his, uh, his, his, his kid's um, mother. And she, he said, I think she wanted to give the kids to me, but she felt like she couldn't because she was the mother. And it's like, what are we taking on as mothers? Because we think it's our job. And so really looking within yourself. Um, the last thing, and this, this goes along, uh, actually two more things, this idea of uh, focusing on the we of the relationship 
rather than the you and I. And that goes back to what John Gottman talks about. You know, his method isn't about division of, of labor, but really keeping that connection that we are we are parenting together. We it's not you and I. It's it's a team. And um, and the last thing that I, I would say, definitely look up John Gottman's Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, because he talks about criticism. You know, there's a difference between being unhappy, complaining and, and criticizing, and then contempt and defensiveness and stonewalling. And if you, those are the, those are the four horsemen that will make your relationship ride into the sunset and blow up. Um, Alexandra. Sorry, I know we need to move to questions, but I wanted to just respond one of your points about like putting putting the we uh, first. Something else we did uh, and we've revisited sometimes when we had done couples counseling was an app called Lasting. Um, and it's like a couples therapy app and it's really, and you have to pay a subscription fee, um, but it's really interesting because they serve you, but you know, you can use it on your own, but they'll serve you like content and kind of ask you questions. And then it surfaces your responses to your partner and you can kind of like talk about the responses. And I think it's a nice way for people. I've had several friends do it off of my recommendation who like, their, their partner is not comfortable with going to couples therapy, but they kind of want to work on their relationship and they want to surface some things and they don't know how to. So I would just, I would recommend that it has a lot of good things like here is a principle for you. Try not to have a serious conversation with your partner when they look really tired and hungry, for instance, you just um, <laughs> things that are good reminders. So that's all. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add two things. One is that we, so we did Gottman therapy before we had a kid. Um, we did like a full Gottman. Pro I had read like all of his books and I was like, this is what we have to do. And it was really helpful. I thought, and kind of like our meeting, like, well, like we, and how we talk to each other and like how we are sort of like planning and like Susan, what you're saying about it being a constant conversation, like we are constantly like every day, every weekend, every month, you know, like we are always like, okay, now what, like, what are we doing now? What hours do you want? What hours do I want? How are you feeling about this? Is this okay for you? Are you going to be able to do this? And it's this, it's a constant negotiation that I think will just continue. And then just to, um, the last thing is my, when we got married, my close family friend said, um, each of you should make sure that you're giving 70% in the relationship. Yeah. Like this is not a 50, 50 thing. Like if each of you feels like you're giving 70%, then you're doing okay. So we really try not to count like, well, you did this last time. So you should do this this time for us. The hours are really important. The time is really important, but everything else we just kind of, we're not like tallying. So no, I think that's really important. Yeah. And then in, in constant communication, but on two levels, there's the constant communication about logistics, who's doing what, who's going where, who's picking up the kid. But then there's this like deeper level of communicate. How do you feel about it? What do you need me to do? Where is this coming from? Where are your triggers coming from? You know, and I think if you've been through couples therapy, that it gets at the root of it quickly. But a lot of couples, I don't think have, have had those deeper conversations and those assumptions and roots and experiences all bubble up into that logistics conversation. And so you kind of have to tackle the two layers at, at once, which it's a lot. I know it's a lot, but I mean, I think that both of you are a testimony that it's necessary. Yeah. And worth and, it. And, and worth it. And absolutely worth it. Um, this idea of having this constant communication goes back to, to another point I wanted to make, which is to always use I statements. I feel not you didn't, or you always, I mean, you can, I, I can post some things from John Gottman and, and a lot of the things I teach in my interpersonal class. Um, and, and John Gottman also has an F free app that where they, where they work on, like, tell us the story of how you met and just, you know, kind of getting those warm, fuzzy feelings again, because when you're up to your eyeballs and diapers and things, you can forget, why did I love this person in the first place? So any questions? How is everybody feeling? Is everybody feeling overwhelmed? Is everybody feeling like they can go, go, go back and say, I would like to have a conversation. You can text us. 
I would like to have a conversation on how to make us happier. So phrase it in the positive. How can we do this better? Any other ideas like conversation starters, Kate? Well, I was going to go back to the questions that you sent me before, because I know a lot of people wanted to watch the tapes. They might not be here to ask the question, but several people said, how do I even start this conversation? My suggestion is always to take it away from you and me. Uh, don't, don't do the blame thing. And off, oftentimes we, in a, in a, ideal world, it would be the person doing less in the household that would start the conversation to say, I have seen the light and I would like to do more. And uh, that doesn't always happen. It's oftentimes the person who's doing more, who's exhausted and frantic and frustrated and feeling resentful that starts the conversation. So when you're in that position, it's a very hard position to be in. And it's easy to start in on the, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I can't do this anymore. But I think it's also important in that conversation to say, how do you feel trapped? Are gender norms impacting you? How are gender, do you feel like there are things you have to do because you are the man of the household, right? Like to, to try really hard not to make assumptions about your partner and to ask those questions about what are you doing right now that you don't really want to do? How are you being impacted? And to, to share about, you know, to keep that whole idea that equality is better for all of us. And um, it, it's, it's not easy to start that conversation when you're exhausted. So maybe, you know, find a time when you're both somewhat well rested and you can be more open. But I think a, starting the conversation about sort of, hey, here's some statistics that we're seeing in North America right now. Lots of couples. That's how I started the conversation with my husband like years ago when then this hall happened. I was working on my PhD. I had a breakdown. I was sitting on my kitchen floor. I was sobbing. Uh, my kids were one and four. Um, and, and he said, what do you want me to do? Tell me what you want me to do. I can't stand seeing you this way. It makes me so sad. And I said, I don't want to tell you what to do anything. I want you to know what to do. And I want you to do it. Telling you what to do is work. And that's, but I was doing my PhD on the intersection of uh, women's empowerment and masculinity. So I had all these statistics on the tip of my tongue. And I said, you're leaning into work. I'm watching you lean into work and pulling away from the kids. And I'm watching me lean away from work. I can barely finish my dissertation. I'm barely showing up to teach my classes and leaning into parenting. And I can see the writing on the wall that it's going to be bad for both of us. So what can we do now to fix that? So you have a great relationship with your kids and you don't mimic that sad relationship you have with your dad that you talk about all the time. And what can I do so that I can have the right? And so talking about the what's going to benefit both of us, and that's what worked for us. And that that conversation I had on the my dirty kitchen floor years ago is what started this whole thing. Um, and I think if we stay open to that idea that equality is better for all of us, hopefully that will get us somewhere. Can I chime in on that? Mm -hmm. I agree with. You've said, and I think I'm channeling my husband in our conversation last night. And he basically, he was like, tell the men, you know, I know the world tells us we can't do this, but it, to, to your earlier points. And he said, the thing is, um, once you're confident in it, you feel amazing. Like you, you're, you really know what you're doing. And he was like, there's stuff in the house that I know how to do way better than you and stuff with the kids. I'm like, I'm proud of that. Um, and I think that also, I don't know the exact right words, but that being like, I have, it's kind of like how you talk to a four-year-old, right? Like, let's, I have confidence that you can do this. I think it's not a conversation starter, but it's in that conversation of saying like, I think that you would be really fantastic at being in charge of like, whatever it is with the kids. And I, I, I think you'd be better than me at it. Like maybe you should take that over and that could help your relationship. I think that's something we do a lot where we're like, I just like, I see that you're better at that and you're awesome and it doesn't matter about the gender role and kind of support that way. That's all. You know, that speaks to a comment that somebody made in, in the, the preamble was to have a better appreciation for my parent, my partner. Yeah. And I have a friend, we've been doing it for eight years and every night she, she and I send three things that we're grateful to each other. You know, I'm grateful about this, not about her. Cause I only see her twice a year, but about <laughs> our lives I'm grateful for. And some days it's, I'm grateful 
that tomorrow is another day, you know, but what are you grateful for? Make sure that you are, you know, have a jar that says, here's what I'm appreciating in my, in my, um, in my relationship with my husband. Here's what I appreciate my, about my kids and really fostering that idea of appreciation. We do have a question. When, a relation, when in a relationship with a project manager who takes on the maturity of the mental load and an employee who needs direction, on, direction to do tasks, how can the couple work to share the mental load more equally, especially when, the pro, when project management does not come naturally to the other partner? I love this question. I'm going to mute myself and let you. I, so I love this question too. My first thing, I don't know anything about you, Christine. So I'm just going to, but I'm going to start by pushing back a little bit and say, is it really that the project manager does not come naturally to this partner? Cause I hear this excuse a lot. Well, she's just better at management. She's just better at multitasking. It's her personality. And I don't think it's personality. I think these are skill sets that we raise women to, to have. We socialize girls because they, they grew up knowing they have to take care of it, that the buck stops with them. I think they're coping skills. It's not really personality. And so I would take personality out of this. Um, I think in extreme cases, you know, I've had people write to me say like, my partner has ADHD. I don't, I'm not a man, you know, I don't, that's not my specialty. So, but I think, that, you know, for most couples, you both have the capacity to take on cognitive labor, right? And so um, I'd like to push back a little bit and say, was it really a personality or is it just they haven't learned the skill set necessary yet? And I think it's really hard with that project manager employee dynamic to have equal partnership. I just think it makes it really hard. So my suggestion would be to find, start with something, one domain, one, maybe it's food, maybe it's laundry, maybe it's you know, scheduling all of the um, health appointments for kids during the year, maybe it's pet care, find something that that employee person in the relationship can take charge of and gain confidence doing and monitor. And then when they've got that one, add one more and then add one more. I think that it really is about learning skills that maybe we didn't have in the past. I'd, I'd love to hear other people's ideas too, but that was my first reaction. Well, I will say that my second child was born and I had a lot of complications from that. And my husband had to step up and it sucked that I had, I had problems in, in, you know, me medical problems, blah, blah, blah. But it made my, it made my, I was a Freudian slip. It made my um, partner, <laughs> ha <laughs> it made my partner have to step up. He figured out what preschool my first daughter was going to go. I mean, he just, and I think it was because I, he had to, but because I wasn't micromanaging him. Like I wasn't, I wasn't in a place to do that. Um, before, before, and, and I want to hear from uh, anybody else about this, but I also want everybody who's still on the line to just take 35 seconds and write down one thing that you're taking away from tonight. One thing that you're taking away from tonight that you'll that you learned or that you're going to focus on you know the hope is that you're taking away something that will will create more equal partnership you know partners in in the future we'd love to hear that what is your one thing and, and, and while we're waiting for that christina i also want to add that um it's really hard to let somebody else project manage. And so if you are saying like, okay, like I, I would ask, what do you want to be in charge of? And not like, I think you should do laundry, you know, but what, what do you want to own? And yeah. then they own it. If you see the laundry piling up because they forgot to do it and you know, you're like, well, they should have done the laundry yesterday. Now it's today up and now it's been two days. Like you actually do need to like, let it be that it's when they run out of underwear that they do the laundry, you know? So, so that, that is something to think about is if, what can you comfortably also, what can the project management partner be comfortable letting go of is, is the other half of that question. And I will add to that. I think I completely agree. <laughs> if you just assign something, then, uh, then that, that defeats some of it. One thing, maybe this isn't a first assignment, but uh, one soon after. One thing we talk a lot about is dividing household tasks and then dividing care of kid tasks where you're establishing that bond. And I think that is also something that can start to transform 
the dynamic because like, you know, it's one thing to say, do the laundry or, or have somebody be in charge of laundry is quite another to say, have somebody be in charge of bedtime every other night and know that that, you know, and I guess this is the same message on maternal gatekeeping, but like for me, uh, as I think many mothers, particularly breastfeeding, like new mothers, um, it was very, very hard for me to let my husband do bedtime and listen to the baby scream and not have the comfort of a breast, which the baby was used to. I had to leave sometimes, but I am so grateful to both of us that we did that because he has his own way with her and he has his own tools. And I think, you know, I guess stepping back and allowing for that to happen in the care part, the diaper changes and the like hands-on stuff with the kids. Um, it's really important. Yeah. Well, we're at a little bit beyond our time. I, I knew this was going to be a, a, an important conversation that was, we could keep talking about this for a long, long time. Um, I am going to suggest that we have a, a book discussion and Kate is welcome to join us or not, but to have everybody buy her book. And let's let's tackle some of the, the chapters that are, are most difficult and um, and do this again and keep the conversation going. And I'm so glad to, I've, I've, before everybody turned off their cameras, I saw a lot of couples on this and that makes me extremely happy. And I think that we can absolutely um, help raise this whole Parksville Parents community into one that is more supportive of equal partnership and just thrives in this idea that we can all we can all do the parenting thing and it doesn't need to be gendered kate any last words i was just going to say to alexandra's point i'm doing a panel on friday it's not going to be live it will be aired in a couple of weeks it's a father's day event there's all this great new research about father's chemistry reaction we the it's not that it, it's just we haven't bothered to research it before. No one asked questions. We've been looking at how a woman responds to being a mom for decades. We're finally finding out all of these fantastic neurological changes that men go through when they have infants. So I'm happy to share that link. I have a couple of professor friends who are going to be on that panel with me to, to dive deeper if anyone is driven by research and evidence to think about, you know, there's so many benefits to men that come with one-on-one um, -on -one time with infants that we're just scratching the surface on now. So I guess any new research. Thank you for this opportunity. It was a pleasure to meet all of you and um, just thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna put Kate's book talk that that's how I found her. I found her through a book talk um, that was great. Uh, the USC book talk. Um, thank you, Lindsay. I hope you guys did get something great out of this. Best to you. And um, Kate will be in touch and I'll be posting everything that you send me because you're awesome. Thank you, Talia and Phil. And thank you, Alexandra. Super helpful. And um, props to you guys for working, working hard, working hard and being willing to come on. So take care, everybody. I'll be in touch and I'll send out the recording for people who might have missed the beginning. Um, hugs to you all. Take care of each other. Thanks, thanks.